Arguably one of the most important tools a lot of the Cavalry Trooper to keep his carbine, but also his hands free. We're going to be talking about the Cavalry carbine. Exactly what the specifications were, how common were they, and do you wear the buckle on the front or on the back? This week on the 11th OVC, the Cavalry carbine. So in preparation for this episode, I actually tried looking at the Quartermaster's Manual on the specifications of the carbine slings that the government ordered, but I honestly could not find anything substantial other than, than they should be uh, leather straps strong enough to be able to carry a long arm. So with that being said, let's look at two original carbine slings and see how our authentic and mainstream reproductions hold up. So when looking at these originals, keep a close eye on the style of the buckle uh, and of course the painted versus unpainted size of the leather and where the rivets were placed on the end caps. This will give you a very good idea when looking at other originals or reproductions for your own impression. As with most leather goods, the biggest difference you can immediately notice is the weight and type of leather used. These originals are very strong yet very light and flexible. And for those of you who've seen our other uh, leather episode for the actual belt for the Cavalry Troopers, uh, this one is very similar. I wish I could somehow portray or describe the difference in the leather, uh, but when you first pick up original leathers, uh, you can definitely tell a difference between the, the, the original leather and the coarse leather that a lot of our reproductions that we get, especially on the mainstream side, that, that you get to feel. Uh, immediately when you pick up the originals, they're very light, but you can tell from, from just the feel very, very strong as well. Uh, also one thing you'll notice is even after a lot of age and, and dehydration, they're also very flexible and, and hang with very uh, very little rigidity. I tried weighing them and showing you a difference in weight, uh, but honestly both the original, I mean both the originals and all the reproductions were so widely all over the place it was honestly not worth going over, but since the weights came in all over the place it wasn't worth uh, analyzing and being in this video, uh, but I would say overall the biggest difference is just the feel, the weight, uh, and the, I guess the type of tanning process used for the, for the original leathers. So now let's dive into the two originals versus the three reproductions and see where they stack up. Uh, the original on top of this picture is about 52 and a half inches in length. And uh, one thing that you'll see here shortly is that really the biggest difference other than the, uh, the weight and the type of tanning and the type of leather used is the length between the originals and the reproductions. The, like I said again, the original on top is 52 and a half inches, whereas the second original just below that, you, as you can see in this picture, is 53 inches. So again, about a half inch longer. So between 52 and 53 inches. Uh, the quality repro right below that is 59 inches long. Uh, and then of course the two mainstream uh, re uh, reproductions below that are 57 and 68 and a half inches respectively. Uh, so as you can see, uh, you know, there's definitely a, a wide variety of lengths out there. But keep in mind, and one thing I've noticed is that uh, originals tend to be a little shorter than the reproductions we get nowadays. So now because I couldn't find any quartermaster specifications on what the quartermaster expected of the carbine slings, I looked at as many originals as I could both in person and online. And from the Civil War auction sites out there, a lot of the original photographs, I would say that a good average of original carbine slings is right anywhere between 52 and 54 inches. Now obviously I couldn't tell that on the, on the photographs, but from the auction sites and some of the originals that have the, the details laid out in, in the museum archives, uh, they actually lay out the the the, dist or the the length and so the average I could find is like I said right around 52 to 54 inches for original carbine slings. So now as far as the width, they were actually all pretty much the same, plus or minus about a quarter inch difference. And I would assume that this would be due to the default of honestly all of them, both reproductions, the originals, having to be slave, I guess, quote unquote, uh, to the buckle itself or the dimensions of the buckle. Now, so now let's move on to something a little bit more interesting, especially the details uh, from the originals and compare them to some of the reproductions out there. 
So you can see in this picture that the style of the buckle includes these two wide teeth. And while most of the reproductions also use this, uh, there is one reproduction that you can see here that does not. Now, keep in mind, this by no means uh, means that it is not authentic or not an authentic repro. Uh, however, it could have been modeled after another type of, of uh, sling, possibly maybe a militia sling or a state sling or anything like that. Uh, but I just found it uh, worth noting that uh, the two originals that we have have those uh, kind of classic wide teeth uh, in the buckle versus uh, one of our reproductions that did not. So next, let's take a look at the fold of the leather uh, over the buckle and the rivets holding the buckle in place. Uh, in the originals, you can see, or especially in this one original, you can clearly see that the unpainted side is folded out and riveted, uh, while the other one is, is not so prominent as you can see. Uh, both of the originals are, are black on the outside and untreated, or I guess uncolored on the inside. Now, compared to the reproductions, most are decent, but definitely one stands out, as you can see in this picture, as a little bit or kind of significantly different than the others as far as the size of the rivets and actually how they were secured to the leather. So when doing this research, one question always seems to stand out in my head uh, with almost any of the gear that we talk about is exactly how common were carbine slings in the cavalry during the American Civil War. Uh, as you've seen in other episodes, we've kind of broken down how common were, were certain carbines. We've also talked about the ling strap and how common or uncommon they were. But in order to really portray the average trooper correctly, we must go to the data and see exactly what was available. So when I did go to the data, one thing that shocked me was throughout the entire war, Eastern, Western theater, uh, or even far west in, in the uh, Dakotas, or even California, is that when troops were issued carbines, they were also issued carbine slings. So while the percentages were definitely still not 100%, it was one piece of gear that is still more prominent than almost any other item that we choose to ride with when you really look at the, uh, the data and the ordnance returns. In fact, the correlation of whether or not you had a sling seems to directly correlate with whether or not you were issued a rifle or a carbine. Early in the war, many CAV units were issued full-length rifles and thus were issued the standard infantry gun sling. But even early in the war, when carbines were issued, so were their appropriate slings. So this, of course, should really not be a surprise, since, the, this, since this method of, of holding a trooper's carbine uh, horseback has been around for decades at this point in time. So it is simply nice to confirm something that we thought was true actually is true. Oh, the joys of research. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was how the length of the slings mattered and how high the troopers secured the swivel in relation to their hip level. Obviously, the longer the carbine sling, the longer it would hang down by your leg. And conversely, the shorter the sling, the higher near your hip your carbine was. The question is, what would have been most common by the troopers at the time? Now, of course, to answer this, the best thing to do is to go to as many original pictures as possible. Now, unfortunately, photographs of mounted troopers, uh, especially in the listed ranks with their carbine slings and carbines on, are pretty rare comparatively. So as you can see here, I threw in some pictures of, of the troopers taking photographs and portraits with their carbines and carbine slings in the studio, which still gives us an idea of the length that they carry the carbine sling. So as you can see from these pictures, it appears that the end of the leather stopped right about the hip bone of the troopers. Now, while there's some variation in some of these photographs, I believe is still a good reference point to go off of. And of course, the remaining question is exactly where do you wear the buckle, uh, whether it's the buckle in the front or the buckle in the back. Uh, and looking at the same period photographs, it is clear that there is not a regulated way, quote unquote, in wearing it, whether you put the buckle in the front or the buckle in the back. Whether it's point sets or co Cognon's Compendium or Cook's Cavalry Tactics or the variety of, of uh, manuals that McClellan did for cavalry during the American Civil War, not one place that I've been able to find specifies exactly where to wear the buckle. So some in our community have explained it clearly by stating simply that a formal review of the general staff officers or of the regiment uh, may require the brass buckle in front flat against the chest since again more brass, shine, polish may have looked good. Meanwhile, troopers in the field, once they're in the field and on campaign, would have quicker, quickly realized that a buckle would easily catch in other straps uh, like your canteen, haversack, sailor belt strap, and all that kind of stuff, and thus the sling with the sling buckle would have been moved to the back. Now, basically speaking, it would have been the user's preference. Some had it in the front, some had it in the back. As you can see from these original photographs, it was either way. 
So either way, I find it interesting and feel excited that we were able to examine two originals today. Uh, so what do you think about the right way to wear the carbine sling and how much of a difference did it make for those that had them? Those of you, especially on the Confederate side that wear uh, your long guns with, with the gun sling around your shoulder, compare that to the carbine sling and the fatigue really, you really get an idea of the difference in carrying your long arm and the benefit allowed to our troopers in the field. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we appreciate it. If you have any comments, please uh, comment below, like us, and ring the notification bell on the right-hand side here. We're excited that you were able to watch us. Thank you again. Support our channel. Like us on Facebook. And until we see you in the field, ride hard.